This is Dr. Robin Murphy with the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue. We have a short informational podcast on small unmanned aerial systems and volcanoes. We've been advising the responders with the ongoing volcanic eruption in Hawaii, and here are six ways that flying small unmanned aerial systems for volcanoes is different than for previous events. As a bit of background, since the first use of small UAS for disasters in 2005 at Hurricane Katrina, they've been used for public safety agencies for hurricanes, building collapses, earthquakes, flooding, wilderness search and rescue, chemical train derailments, mining and nuclear accidents, critical infrastructure accidents, landslides and mudslides, and wildland firefighting. So they've got quite a background in using unmanned systems. But volcanoes are different. And to see this, let's start with probably the closest to a volcano is a mudslide. So if you look at mudslides and you look at the way you you would try to think about how missions are, the payloads, the data products, the work envelope, the area in which the robot is working, and the operator envelope, which is where the operator has to work you see some differences. So let's just go through with the mudslides and in particular let's look at at what we learned at the Oso mudslides which we assisted Sonomish County with in 2014. So the the missions are four of the seven classic missions. There's the debris damage assessment mission, there's the general strategic situation uh, mission, the tactical situation mission that well you know, we're there, where are the the people in the field? And then detailed inspection, and that's probably the biggest one. The preferred payloads, video cameras, and anything that can give you range data, which of course you can get from photogrammetrics from video. Uh, LiDAR is also a nice touch, should you have one, a platform that can support it or small enough uh, sensor. The data products, ortho mosaics. You want to catch the boundaries of where the landslide mudslide is. And being able to take that daily means you can compare them and change over time. Likewise, you want the digital elevation maps. You want that volume. Where is everything now? First person view. Always, the responders always love to be able to see in real time what they're looking at so that being able to live stream that and likewise live streaming for tactical overwatch where are my people in the field right now Uh, the work envelope you know mudslides landslides don't happen on on nice flat beaches and in uh, wetlands they happen in the mountains so the terrain is not flat Uh, they may not be there may be tall trees there may be one tree that is way taller than the other uh, and certainly you start seeing that impacting fixed altitude sorties. So, so now you have to start thinking about stair-stepping your different search missions and your, your photogrammetric runs. The operator envelope, as with almost every disaster, you have very limited access. There's just some very few places that you can get to where you can stand and launch uh, a UAV, either a fixed wing or a rotocraft. But look what you get. I mean, here is an example of an orthomosaic digital elevation map that was created uh, by our team in under three hours. So uh, less than an hour of flight time and then three hours of post-processing time on a very powerful laptop. As we're driving back, look what you're able to get, a complete view, and then even better, you can fly through and see at detail. So this was at the level of four centimeter uh, resolution. Wonderful if you're trying to figure out what's going on. So you can imagine with all the tools we have now that can take what we did yesterday and now subtract out where the difference is, you know, hugely powerful uh, software now that exists to do this. So how are the how volcanoes different? Well, they're fine with missions, but the first big difference between that and a pay is in the terms of payloads. So whereas before we're looking at video and range, now we, you know, volcanoes are hot. So thermal is important. Volcanoes are erupting gas. So using some of the uh, four gas meters that are now being adapted for use by unmanned uh, systems be great and multispectral. We don't know how effective multispectral will be, but we believe it's going to give us some information. Another set of differences, the data products. We've talked about all the data products before with the orthomosaics and the digital elevation maps being very, very important, 
but that whole process is obscured by the gaseous eruptions. And in the case of Hawaii, you've got a little bit of fog and cloud cover. So that really impacts the photogrammetrics, whether you can stitch those images together and how, uh, how accurate you can get from it. Another way they're different, <laughs> two other ways, is, is that work envelope. I mean, we already know, you know, mountains, trees, those sorts of things. But now we're talking about heat. So we're talking about the same problem you see in wildland firefighting. You get the updrafts, and if you're a fixed wing, you're still kind of compensating, but you get that unpredictable rule in there that really can interfere with your mapping uh, accuracy on the data collection. And the thermal emissions actually mean that it favors night flights. So they're doing a lot of night flights to capture data. Another difference is in the operator envelope. So really, a volcano is a hazardous material event. There's a high risk of exposure to gases. You're, you're carrying and got to work with your personal protective equipment. So there, you've got a larger standoff distance for safety. So it's a lot like a chemical train derailment or a general hazmat event. And it also, for this reason, favors autonomous missions where the operators can bolt for safety if they have to, but the UAV remains in air and e is either returning home on its own or the, and then the, the operators are flying it back to where they wound up being, the, the safe point there. So, as you can see, volcanoes are quite different. Uh, and if we want to summarize, it's really the why and the what is similar to mudslides, but the how we do it is very, very different. The imagery is obscured by the gaseous emissions. There's night flying and autonomous flight path planning that we don't see quite as much in, the, in mudslides. And the, the hazardous material component that really puts operators at risk and needs different kinds of sensors. And plus there's a fire component that impacts heat component that uh, impacts f flight characteristics. Follow us on Twitter at Crasar and visit our website at Crasar.org for more guides on how to use unmanned systems for disasters. And as always, let us know how we can help you respond to disasters.